Lord, in a world where so much is shaky, you are a solid foundation for our lives. Lord, in a world where so many things are flaky, you are consistent and faithful and loving and compassionate and just. God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your presence, Lord. God, this morning we come to you Lord, with open hearts, with open minds. God, thank you for your word that can speak to us right where we're at. Lord, bless this time together, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, good morning. I'm excited. We get to continue our series called God, Give Me a Sign, where we've been looking at the seven signs of Jesus in the book of John. Over the last few weeks, we've seen how all of these signs, Jesus was meeting an immediate need or speaking to an immediate injustice. But in the midst of it all, there was another layer. Jesus was using these seven signs to point to an eternal reality. Jesus gave us these signs to lead us to faith in him as Messiah, as Lord, as the one who is worthy of our worship. So we're going to pick it up in John chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 18. And I want to encourage you to grab a Bible and follow along. John writes this. He writes, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there and had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else always gets there ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day. And I am working too. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So there's a lot that can be said about this piece of scripture. And as I was working through it, I realized that I could preach like four different sermons on this one text. You see, I love the Bible. You can study it for years and years and years, and God will continually say something new and fresh and relevant for your life where you are at. It is impossible to exhaust the wisdom and the spiritual nourishment that comes from Scripture. Now, while I appreciate this depth of wisdom in the Bible, as a preacher, 
Sometimes I wrestle with what part of a passage to emphasize. I take this seriously. I feel the weight of responsibility each week as I stand before you and share from God's word. I want to ask you again to remember me in your prayers. We are a community of worship and a community of the word. And I need your help. So this is what the Lord has laid on my heart this week. I'm going to share with you a couple things that I believe are really important. But first, we're going to take a look at what's happening in this passage. So the scene is the pool of Bethesda. This was a place in Jerusalem that many people felt was very special. The idea was that every once in a while, an angel would come from heaven and come down and stir the waters of the pool. This stirring was said to activate some sort of healing power in the water. And whoever could make it to the water first, their reward was their miraculous healing. So imagine the scene with me. Imagine a big group of the most marginalized, dependent, and hopeless of their society. These were folks who had been abandoned and largely ignored. This is where the sick, the blind, the mute, the disabled, all waited and prayed and sought God for a miracle. This was a long time ago. This is first century Palestine. This was not an era of great social spending. There were no government supports, no hospitals, no wheelchairs, no wheelchair ramps. This was a time where the average life expectancy was only 40 years old. And here Jesus meets a man who has had no use of his legs and has been waiting by this pool for 38 years. His whole life, he has been dependent and living off of the charity of other people. He needed helpful strangers to pick him up and move him around. He probably lived off of the food he received from begging. His hands were calloused and beaten up from having to drag himself around day after day after day. And every day, this man tried to get to the pool first because he wanted to be healed. And every day, someone beat him. But on this day, his luck was about to change. You see, Jesus has deep compassion for the suffering, for the forgotten, and for the abused. That brings me to the first big piece of this sermon. And it comes to us uh, right here in, which verse is it here? Up, 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 up. Verse six, Jesus says, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? At first glance, this seems like a bit of a dumb question. This is a guy by the pool of Bethesda. And that was kind of the point of being at that pool. But after we reflect on this a little bit, you realize that maybe it's not such a dumb question after all. Have you ever been half-hearted about something? Maybe there was part of you that wanted to change. But then there was another part of you that was kind of comfortable where you were at. As human beings, we naturally avoid the unknown. We naturally avoid change and, and can fear it. In fact, even good change can be a scary prospect for us. We can become so comfortable with where we're at in our lives, even if the situation 
maybe isn't actually that great. Have you ever experienced that in your life? As a pastor, I get to walk through life with people and have meaningful conversations every day. It's one of the things I, I really love. And I can think of multiple times over the years where fear of change holds people back, where fear of change has held me back. It's possible that, that people can get stuck in addiction, that it sucks the life out of them. Maybe stuck in a career that, that you don't even like or stuck dating someone that you know is a compromise to your values. I've seen people take steps towards Jesus, get a small taste of freedom, enjoy it for a short time, but then run back to their old lives. Why do we do this? Meaningful relationships take time and effort and vulnerability. You can't experience love without vulnerability, without the prospect of potentially being hurt. Many choose their sin. Many choose to be alone and are miserable and in bondage just because they're afraid of being hurt. That addiction that you wrestle with, as much as it fills you with shame and isolates you, you go to it for a reason. It gives you something. It gives you a rush of dopamine. Maybe it helps you escape the world. And maybe you start believing the lie that nothing else can make you feel the way it does. That it's better to escape the world, to run from it, to numb yourself, than it is to learn to engage the world courageously and honestly with God. Sometimes we know there's things that we need to deal with in our souls, in our lives, things that happened to us in the past, and we just pretend it's not there. We, we push it down. We don't want to deal with the real issues. Even if we know somehow that dealing with those things will lead to freedom, we can be afraid of the process. And you know, I don't have to look very far to relate. In, in my own life, I've struggled with the fear of the unknown. I've struggled with trusting God for the future. God has continually tapped Jessica and me on, on the shoulder and asked us to step forward in faith and step forward in risk. And again and again, we have and been terrified. But then God blesses. And I don't know why, but I'm still surprised when God shows up. You know, the, the Israelites left Egypt and they saw all these miracles and they're on the way to the promised land and, and they're complaining. When the truth is, they saw God do all of these miracles in the past. You think they would trust God for the future. Sometimes I struggle with that. And I'm freaked out when, when God asks me to step out, even though I've seen him come through again and again. Change is hard. Even Good change can be hard for us. The question is, do we trust that life with God is better than the things he calls us to leave behind? In the case of our story, this man at the pool had been paralyzed for his whole life. This was a central part of his identity as a person. Every day, he woke up and his legs didn't work. What if being healed and having legs that worked didn't live up to his expectations? What if instead of begging, he had to then get a job? What happens when the guy begins to date, when he enters the dating world? You know, commentators and 
Historians tell us that first century Tinder and Jewish Mingle were absolutely brutal dating services. <laughs> All of a sudden, this question Jesus asks, do you want to get well, starts making sense. Do you want to get well? This paralyzed man is a good picture of us, of humanity in our sin. We are all sinners. We all come to God in complete and utter need of his grace. Sin separates us from God. And God is the very source and definition of life and light and love itself. And yet we choose to sit by the pool, stuck in our sin, in our brokenness. And sometimes we're half-hearted about being, about finding healing. Every once in a while, we may have a half-hearted attempt to get well. Maybe you go to church. Maybe you read a book every now and then. Whatever it is. But the question is, will we trust Jesus for our healing? Do we really want to get well? Jesus told this guy in verse 8, he says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And he did. And he was healed. He had to stand up. Are we prepared to stand up in faith? Jesus today asks us for our consent, for our participation in the process of our healing. The good news is that Jesus does all the heavy lifting. He does all the healing, but we have to want it and we have to stand up. To use familiar language to bridge church, Jesus is our bridge to God, but we have to walk across it. We have to take that step of faith. And so that's the first thing. Do we want to be well? The second thing is this. Look at the response of the religious leaders. So Jesus is healing this guy, and he's doing so on the Sabbath. Not only is Jesus healing on the Sabbath, but he also tells this guy to pick up his mat and walk with it. This is significant. Remember that the Sabbath, the day of rest, was a big deal to the Jewish people. It was like a weekly festival, in a sense. It was a weekly remembrance of their religious and cultural identity. It's what set them apart from the Gentiles. And they took great pride in their observance of the Sabbath. But the problem was, they loved their rules more than God. And the leaders of the people took it too far. The laws of the Old Testament were to be observed, of course. But then they added rules on top of the rules. The rabbinic literature of the time tells us that there was 39 categories of ways people should practice the Sabbath. And picking up anything and walking with it was one of those things you weren't supposed to do. And so Jesus heals a guy on the Sabbath and then tells him to pick up his mat, pick up his bed, and walk. Needless to say, the religious leaders lost their minds. And so they stand in these verses in judgment of Jesus. They put Jesus on trial. They also didn't like that Jesus uh, worked on the Sabbath. And Jesus, in his response, he says in verse 17, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. This was quite the claim. You see, Scripture tells us that when the world was created, on the seventh day, God rested. But the truth is, he never stopped being God. He never stopped working to sustain and uphold the entire universe. And thank goodness, God cannot stop being God. 
And what Jesus is saying is that my father is always working and so am I. Jesus is saying that he can do whatever he wants on the Sabbath. He's saying he's Lord of the Sabbath. And the Jewish leaders, it says, recognized that he was calling God his father and making himself equal with God. This is a claim that Jesus was saying, I am divine. God is my father. And so this is just another reason for the religious leaders to lose their minds. But when we look at this, there are a couple of things that are just dripping with irony. The first being that none of these religious leaders seem very pumped that this man who's never walked is now walking. Uh, this seems like it should be an obvious reason for celebration. Instead, they're more concerned about how the man was healed and when the man was healed, as opposed to the fact he was healed. Very tone deaf, to say the least. And the other irony is, is that they're accusing Jesus of breaking the scriptures when the situation was that Jesus was actually fulfilling the scriptures right in front of them. In Isaiah 35, 6, it was prophesied that the Messiah would, I think it says, to make the lame leap like a deer. The religious leaders are so caught up in their own self-imposed religious rules that they can't see God himself working right in front of their eyes. So what does this mean for us? Well, the truth is, is that Jesus is still on trial today. The world has him on trial. And we can put him on trial too, if we're really honest. As human beings, we love predictability. We like to have a plan. We love our systems and rules and structures, even in the church. I first became a follower of Jesus in a religious tradition that said that A plus B always equals C. In a sense, they, they put God in a box. But in this passage and elsewhere, we see that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus will not be put on trial and certainly not in a box by us. Another thing this makes me think is what happens when God heals other people or shows up in their lives in a way that is not as neat and tidy as we would like. Sometimes we look at the Christian life and we see others coming to Jesus and healing and growth we think should look a certain way and work in a very linear fashion. Uh, we think things should be just up and to the right all the time. But the truth is that's not the way it works. The truth is, is that God is at work in this world. He's at work in his people. And he is very, very mysterious. The spirit of God doesn't just work within four walls on a Sunday. God's spirit shows up in the most unlikely of places at the most unlikely of times. In those darkest moments in your life, in the times you felt the most isolated, and alone, and desperate, God is just as present as the times where you feel him there, where you feel like you're on top of the mountain. These Pharisees in our story remind me of the older brother in that you know, classic story of Jesus about the prodigal son. The son comes home after wasting his inheritance, full of sin, full of shame. And the father meets him on the driveway and wraps his arms around him and throws a big party because his son has returned. <laughs> but then he has an older brother. And the older brother's like, what? This isn't how it's supposed to work. Where's my party, dad? And this is kind of like the Pharisees. So today is an invitation for healing 
and surrender. Do you see this sign of Jesus today? The Jesus who will not be put in a box, who we want to put on trial, but who is the ultimate judge. This is the Jesus who invites us into a new life filled with mystery and saturated with his presence. At the end of the day, this passage invites us to let Jesus be Jesus. He says to you and he says to me, in the depths of our hearts, do you want to get well? To follow Jesus is to take a step of faith, to let go of the old ways and embrace the new. Change is scary, and we can acknowledge that. Even good change makes us uncomfortable at the beginning. But the risk is, if we do not consent to God's healing, if we do not stand up, pick up our mat and walk, we will miss out on life today and maybe even life in eternity. Will you let Jesus be Jesus today? When you see him at work in the lives of other people, are we quick to judge? Or, will, or can we just surrender to God's will? That he has a plan and it's bigger than we can understand. Things aren't always linear. He moves outside of our own black and white sort of thinking. Will we let Jesus be Jesus? Will we open our hearts to others and to God himself? Will we celebrate with the Father? Let's pray. Jesus, we are the guy who cannot move down by the water. God, we confess that in our sin, we are not capable of moving forward. God, we need your grace. We need your presence with us. We need your healing, God. And so we say, Jesus, you are our bridge to God, and we will walk on that bridge. We will stand up and allow you to do your work of grace in our lives. And Lord, when we see you at work in others, God, we're going to trust you in that process. Lord, bless everybody who's watching this today. Lord, bless Bridge Church as we move closer and closer to celebrating your death and your resurrection, the linchpin, the moment where everything changed and hope burst into the world. God, we love you. We give you our lives. May you be honored and glorified, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're back next week. God bless.